Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, welfare reform was one of the centrepieces of David Cameron's programme when the Conservatives first came into office in 2010. But where are we six years on? Today, the government has announced new plans to help more disabled people into employment, which they say will provide a more targeted and personalised way to help more people find jobs. But with pressure on ministers to make work pay and reduce welfare spending, what's the bigger picture? Damien Green said earlier this month that his vision was a welfare state fit for the world of work in the 21st century. So what issues are on the Work and Pension Secretary's desk? Work capability assessments, the scheme that assesses claimants of disability benefits, are set for an overhaul as part of plans announced today. Statutory sick pay and GP fit notes are also to be reviewed as part of an effort to help disabled people back into work. But the government still faces criticism for failures by Concentrix, a private company contracted to tackle benefit fraud that has been accused of incorrectly withdrawing tax credits from hundreds of claimants. The flagship Universal Credit Scheme is up and running, but is not forecast to be fully delivered until 2022, 11 years after it was first announced. The Conservative MP, Heidi Allen, has called for cuts to work incentives in the scheme made by George Osborne to be reversed. And there's increased scrutiny over the triple lock. That's the government's pledge that the state pension will always rise by wages, prices or 2.5%, whichever is higher. Former Work and Pension Secretary Ian Duncan-Smith told the Sunday Politics yesterday that it was time to scrap that pledge and spend the money elsewhere. Well, Damien Green, one of Mr Duncan Smith's successors as Work and Pensions Secretary, was talking earlier this morning about those new plans to help more disabled people into work. Here's what he had to say. Well, the system isn't working well enough for uh, large numbers of people. Uh, we've, we've got huge numbers of people, unprecedentedly high numbers of people in work, about 80 per cent, um, but just under 50 per cent of people with a disability. And what I want to do is to tap into the huge amount uh, of talent there is there uh, and also you know, most of those people do want to work and so the system needs to change so that all of them can work. We aspire to be a government that works for everyone uh, and that includes all those people who want to work but now can't and that requires changes not just in Job Centre Plus, uh, the, the, the things I'm directly responsible for, uh, but also in the health service and in the attitude of uh, employers. Damien Green there. Penny Morden, the government is reviewing the work capability assessment, as we've just said. By doing that, are you admitting that it's not currently fit for purpose? Well, I think it, it could be improved dramatically, um, both in terms of the process. Um, currently, we don't make good use of all the bits of information that different parts of government has. We require people to fill in too many forms um, and give the state information, the same information over and over again. So I think there's, there's a lot that still can be done with the process. We have obviously made some announcements on changing that mm. for example not requiring people with degenerative conditions to go for retest but we think that there is some further more fundamental reforms that are required particularly splitting out the the, the finance from any conditionality that we place on an individual why is it taking so long well, I'm very conscious. I've been in the department 18 weeks, I think, and my entree looks very different to the one that Ian Duncan Smith had to uh, tackle when uh, he took over the department. So I think we are building on the reforms that uh, that he's done. But it's a slow um, process. But it is. Uh, uh, I think there were some other things that were were very pressing that he wanted to tackle. But we are now in a position because of work done um, and because of actually other reforms that that the work capability assessment has undergone to take this fundamental look and I think I think it is uh, it is long overdue uh, but uh, it's very important that we start the consultation and something that should have been done then by Ian Duncan Smith perhaps hadn't gone as far as he should have done with those reforms I think I well we are we are continuing uh, a program of work that he set out the the reason why this is so important is that currently you have uh, people with a health condition or who have a, um, a disability who are parked 
uh, with no support. So actually, ironically, those that need the most help don't get it because we have we have money uh, attached to. Uh, the conditions that we, we place on someone. Right. That needs to be reformed. We'll talk about uh, some of the incentives for people with chronic um, illnesses or long-term conditions in just a moment. But first of all, do you welcome the fact that this review is actually happening? Even if you think it's uh, long overdue, is it the right sort of review? Well, as you've just said, Joe, actions speak louder than words. And we've, we've known for a number of years that the work capability assessment uh, isn't working. It dehumanises people. There was a, a piece of research out last year that was showing it actually exacerbates mental health conditions, actually increasing uh, suicides. So there are all sorts of issues that are associated with not just the work capability assessment, but other aspects of the welfare Do you accept process. that, Penny Moore? Do you accept that assessment, that that's what it's done to people who are either disabled and claiming benefits? benefits uh, or other people with long-term conditions who have to go through that work assessment, that it's actually caused them to become more ill or in some cases commit suicide? I think that the, the leaving aside the, the fundamental reforms we want to do to the policy, the delivery of that policy is absolutely critical. And I think even if you don't have uh, a um, anxiety or, or depression or, or anything that could be exacerbated by such a process, if you are having to go through an enormous amount of bureaucracy, um, an unnecessary number of assessments, that is not going to do anyone any good at all. So I think there are there are, it's the process as well as what we're trying to get out of right. it. Right, so, so you admit that that hasn't helped in, in many people's cases in terms of trying to deal with what, uh, what probably what difficult things, but just, just to bring you, because the government statement announcing these plans includes references to helping people with long-term conditions, mm -hmm. but we've already heard today on the BBC from people with long-term conditions like rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. or Parkinson's. Uh, there is a sort of threat or depending an incentive hanging over those people that they are going to be reassessed despite the fact that they have long-term conditions which would make it very difficult for them to go back to work. Do you accept that? No, I, I mean the part of the reason that we're doing this paper jointly with health is because we realise it's not just employment support interventions uh, that need to be improved. It's also about uh, people who need access to uh, pain management, uh, physiotherapy, a whole raft of interventions, mental health support uh, being uh, a particularly poignant one. Um, that's why we're, we're producing this paper today because we, we know that to date the systems have not worked uh, to assist those people. But let me just be very clear that those people who are not able to work um, will not be required to work. That right. is absolutely Well, fundamental. and that will come as some comfort to people. Of course, the definition of who is not able to work will no doubt still be up for interpretation. But, but you said... Yeah, but can I just put to you, first of all, the Debbie Evans, you said yesterday the government's approach was ideologically driven with the sole purpose of targeting the most vulnerable in society. What's your evidence for that? Well, well first of all, let, let me just uh, comment on what Penny has, has, has just said. We are in the context of an NHS financial crisis, um, not just that social care crisis. If we're talking about support for disabled people, some, some basic support about helping them get out of bed in the morning, where on earth is that going to uh, come from? So this is completely pie in the sky. Uh, idea. We're having employment support cuts for uh, disabled people by more than a third. Again, how is this about helping uh, getting disabled people into work? It's, it's all very well. As I said, these are, are, are fine words, but action speaks much louder. Right, so you're going to wait to see what the actions actually are. But come back to the question, ideologically driven with the sole purpose of targeting the most vulnerable in society. Do you stand by that claim that that's what the government is doing? I think if we look at what's happened over the last few years, thir nearly £30 billion pounds of cuts to 3.7 million people. We've got another 1,500 uh, in terms of the uh, per year for people on ESA RAG. These are the most vulnerable people in society uh, and we shouldn't be targeting, uh, targeting them. There's no evidence in terms of the approach that the government is, is taking. This is about getting uh, people off flow purely and simply. Right, so what do you say? It is I, ideologically I, and you are targeting the most that, vulnerable in society because is, the cuts show that. No, I think that is, um, that is very wrong. And I think there is, um, You're right, it is, there wrong. is a <laughs> mood to portray not just uh, government but also those people that are 
uh, providing those services in our job centres as people that that don't care. And this issue it's should be an issue job centers that have come where to we me are and building. Said people are being targeted. Common I've had, cause and common ground. I've had. It is, I've had hang constituents. On, don't talk over each other. Just finish your sentence, Debbie, and I'll come back. I've to had a constituent who worked in the job centre for over 20 years who came to me and said that uh, claimants are being targeted. There are targets around getting people off loan, whether that's sanctions or through work capability assessment. If you have targets where it's about profit, if it's driven by the incentive to make profit and there are quotas, then surely you yeah. are going to get a situation no, is... where people are treated as if they're in a sausage no. factory. So um, it used to be the case that um, uh, job centre staff were uh, their performance uh, was managed on whether they got someone off a benefit. Th this was not a smart way of uh, doing things because no one sort of monitored where they were going, whether they were going into work or, or into another benefit. What we should be measuring and what the thrust of the Green Paper is and changes that we have made um, over the last 18 weeks is measuring individuals distance travelled. There will be some people whose goals are to get back into full-time work. There will be some people whose goals are meaningful activity and there will be some people that will not be able to do any of that. And we should be looking at what support that individual needs sure. to reach their own ambitions. But the companies that the government has employed and taken on to do these jobs haven't ha had a good track record in dealing with people on a human individual basis so far uh, if you believe all the stories and and you know many uh, ministers and shadow ministers have said so and on that Concentrics, the company that was contracted by the government to mm. tackle tax credit fraud and have been accused of incorrectly withdrawing benefits from hundreds of families. Do you accept ministers bear responsibility for this by incentivising payment by results? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that the, the issues that we have with tax credits are, are serious. They're absolutely unacceptable. Um, I've had them in my, my own constituency. They're quite wrong. But what we need to do is to ensure that whether it's in a contract whether it's how we mm. performance manage our staff, that the right incentives sure. are there. So they were the, the wrong incentives, the weren't they? If you do incentivise by payment, by results, then you are going to get the sort of, uh, you know, very sad stories that we hear as a result of going through the system. Well, I think, I think in the case of the, the tax credits, the, the, the problem there is, is some of the IT systems that they've been using have been... Uh, throwing up, uh, I mean, we had a case the other day of a, um, someone that was accused of living with a shop, you know, mm. it was the name of a, um, a shop they were living uh, above. There were clearly problems with that. Uh, um, and that does the contract. government owe those people an well, apology? I, I think absolutely. I think absolutely. We, we have got to accept that uh, the policy is one thing, and even if we have the, the perfect policy, and it's absolutely right, we also have to ensure that it is delivered right. uh, in, in an excellent way. And I would just say that it, with regard to um, the Department of Work and Pensions and our staff, our staff are subject matter experts with these issues with disability and so forth. But just to give you, no, no, they're not medical professionals. No, I mean, no, that's no, no. nonsense. That is, that but is <laughs> not. We have, we have um, expert disability advisors. We have. Well, condition you have specific. one. Your specialist disability employment advisors. You have one for every six hundred uh, well, disabled that's people. Why How, we're, you can possibly say that's that why you're we're generally committed to bringing making out difference. another three hundred. Well, of these Debbie Abrahams, on the basis that Penny Mordaunt says, actually, ministers should apologise for um, the tax credit debacle, which meant hundreds of single parent families had their tax credit stopped. You welcome that apology, I presume? I do. I mean, I thought the statement that uh, General Ellison gave last uh, week was a very measured one, and I thought, you know, she did her credit. Right. And now, when we look at what will be in the contracts in future for work capability assessments, do you accept Penny Morton's word that it will be different, that it won't just be incentivising uh, payment by results? Performance management is absolutely key. So, yes, I think governments of all colours have not been good around contracting, both in terms of the design, but then in terms of performance managing it. Uh, and we all need to get better uh, uh, around that. But having said that, I'd like to know what, what are we going to do about access to work with 1.3 million disabled people who are fit and able to work, want to work, uh, and there are only 35,000 able to get access to work to help them both stay in a job but also to get back to work. It just the figures don't match, and what I'd be interested in, the specifics around that. Right. What about Ian Duncan Smith, the comments he made uh, yesterday and at the weekend? More than half of the welfare budget goes on pension and benefits, as you know. Ian Duncan Smith suggested that it might be time to do away with the triple lock. Do you agree with him? 
Um, I don't, as a former chairman of the All Party Group on Older People and Ageing, I would, I would point out that the older you are, the higher your cost of living. Is it still so affordable? I think, well, I think, uh, I think it is, uh, and I think it is uh, important that we protect those uh, benefits for pensioners. Do you agree? Yes. Right, so you should stay in place, yes. and that would be Labour's policy to continue with the triple lock. Absolutely. What, right. What, what about the welfare cap and how much the government spends overall on social security benefits? Very popular policy, but it's breached. It's pretty well been breached every year since it's brought in. Is, is there any point continuing with it? Well, I think that it is important that we have welfare spending under control. That is uh, something which is now in place. But we do also need to look at ensuring, as Debbie mentioned, that the reach of our programmes uh, is as they need be. There will be in the Green Paper, um, I know it hasn't been <laughs> published, <laughs> uh, published yet, yet uh, <laughs> but there will be um, very much a focus on that. Uh, and we've got to ensure not only the reach, but we've got to ensure the quality of these programmes as well. Right. The cuts that George Osborne introduced um, to made to work incentives offered by uh, the general scheme, this was moving into universal credit, should they be reversed, as Heidi Allen said? There's no plans to do that. And what I would say to Heidi and others who are concerned about that is to look at the the whole package for those individuals in terms of um, the living wage, in terms of uh, their personal uh, right. tax contributions the point uh, and is though, child care the, as well. But the point is, according to the Resolution Foundation, a single parent with a child under four working full-time on that minimum wage will receive £3,600 less. Yeah. How is that going to help those families who are just managing, the very people Theresa May says she wants to help? Well, I met with that organisation last week and what I would say is you have to look at the package of support that we're giving people in the round, which includes those other things that I've mentioned. Yeah, I could, I, this is absolutely outrageous. Uh, universal credit was meant to be uh, introduced to make work pay, and we supported it on that basis. Uh, on average, uh, two and a half million families will be over £2,000 a year worse off. We have now a situation where there are more families who are in work living in poverty than than there are workless uh, families. This is an absolute travesty, and it's happened under this government's watch. Two thirds of the four million children living in poverty are from working families. We must reverse these cuts if we are are going to have a meaningful impact. Right, and something you're going to do, is it, to try and work on the government? Absolutely, we All call right. for them and want it. Now, prejudice and misunderstandings which stop disabled people getting work have to end. That was the message from ministers as they published their Health and Work Green Paper. They want early treatment to help and encourage those affected to get into work. But as Kamian Zerum reports, the government is itself accused of stoking intolerance in the past by cutting benefits for disabled people. Emily Davison finally has a job. She's been looking for six years. The stress and confusion has been exhausting. As well as a visual impairment, she has a complex gene disorder, which means her mobility and energy levels change by the day. And add to that the potential prospect of a much criticised benefit test, a work capability assessment. It's trying to have to explain to people my condition and how it affects me, and that is extremely stressful because I think to an extent you can be made to feel like you're, you know, fabricate, you're fabricating it or that you know, it's not as severe as it, as it sounds. But... Charities today gave cautious welcome to government plans to reform the system in a work and health green paper, with proposed changes not just to work capability assessments, but also how health and social care can affect getting disabled people into jobs. More disabled people are in work, half a million more than just three years ago. That's encouraging, but we need to build on that progress and do more to help disabled people reach their full potential. It's clear that for many disabled people, the barriers to entering work are still too high. But this government is under fire for its recent changes to the benefit system, and today's announcement marks a softening of tone. The Secretaries of State for Work and Pensions and Health, plus the Disability Minister today visiting a firm who actively support staff with their access needs like publisher Mark Russell. He has a visual impairment, but magnification software means he can get on with his work just like everyone else. Changing attitudes is never, never easy, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a longer term project, I guess. But if there's one thing that many want ended straight away, it's the work capability assessment.
so many of my friends and colleagues and people that I've met with disabilities have had to go through this system and they've been put under so much stress and concern because they fear that it's going to impact on their life and they're not going to be able to support themselves or then they're not going to get the right support that they need. Emily started her job last month. It's part time, just what she wanted, but it has been a long, long time coming. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to the Minister for Disabled People, Penny Mordaunt. I began by asking her if the government might scrap the controversial work capability assessment altogether. We're looking at fundamental reforms, yes. I think that we, we're always going to have to have some kind of assessment process. We need to make sure that people are accessing the right type of benefits. Uh, and we need to also ensure that people are getting the right kind of support. So there's going to have to be some process to that. But I think the work capability assessment uh, has not done the job it needs to do. It's not giving us uh, the support that's built around that individual. It's not tailored to them enough. You say you'll need some kind of assessment still in place, but isn't the truth that this culture of reassessing disabled people endlessly it was supposed to save money, it hasn't, mm -hmm. and actually what it has done is caused untold pain and misery to many, many disabled people? Well, I think that one of the things we want to do is to look at actually how we cut down the amount of hoops people have to jump through to get support. The government's Benefit cuts have been described as cruel. The former Secretary of State resigned over another tranche of cuts. Uh, he's calling on the government to reverse the latest cuts to universal credit. Is that something that you would urge the Chancellor to consider? Well, what we need to do is ensure that people are getting the support that they need. Um, we're not going to unpick uh, previous decisions, but what we have said is that there will be no more cuts to welfare. When you don't have your work and pensions hat on, uh, you're obviously one of the leading pro-Brexit ministers. Are you getting the Brexit that you wanted? I think so. I mean, I was obviously campaigning for the, for the UK to leave, um, and I did so because I have absolute faith in our, in our country. Um, I think businesses are choosing to stay here. But some businesses are potentially only choosing to stay, like Nissan, for example, because they've got sweeteners promised by the government. No, I don't, I don't think that is the case. Um, we have these conversations with business all the time. It's quite right that we provide uh, confidence to those industries to remain in the UK. Penny Morden, thank you very much. Thank you. Listen carefully to the Work and Pensions Secretary, Damien Green, and you might discern a different tone when it comes to welfare to the one we've been familiar with. Today there was a green paper on disability benefits that seemed to be talking more about support to help the disabled into work than the need to sanction them, and the government's reviewing the deeply unpopular work capability assessments. So does this mark a significant change of direction, a retreat from an era of money-saving reforms and harsh rhetoric? Well, Nick Watt has been trying to find out. Welfare is a perennially tricky area for government, but is there a change in the air? If you put in charge a one-nation Tory, the wets to Margaret Thatcher, the tone is bound to soften. Of course, the health and welfare systems must support those that will never be able to work. It should offer the opportunity of work for all those who can, provide help for those who could, and care for those who can't. Damien Green hopes to usher in a new era after David Cameron's troubled legacy, but he has a major headache. Philip Hammond will make clear in his autumn statement later this month that money is tight. And anyway, the government is locked into an expensive commitment on the biggest area of welfare spending. It will stand by its manifesto pledge to ensure that pensions rise by at least 2.5% or by the average of earnings or prices if they are higher. I am absolutely a champion for pensioners. Pensioners in society have to be protected and we have to have a decent state pension and level of support. However, in the broader societal scheme of things, to come up with some made up number of two and a half percent, which has no relationship whatsoever to anything that may be going on in the economy at the time, doesn't really make sense. Politically, it's something you can point to, but are we making policy for the politicians or are we making policy for the people of this country? Number 10's determination to uphold the pensions triple lock during the lifetime of this parliament means there's very little room for manoeuvre on welfare spending. 
Newsnight understands that there's some sympathy at senior levels in Whitehall for one key Tory backbench demand. That is to ensure that George Osborne's reversal of tax credit cuts applies to the new universal credit as well. The tight public finances means that's not on the cards at the moment, guaranteeing a bumpy ride in Parliament for ministers. Heidi Allen has crafted a modest proposal to soften the impact of universal credit in its current form. I would like to focus on those most severely affected, that's single parents and second earners, and that would cost somewhere between £500 and £1 billion. Still an awful lot of money, but if we can keep those people in work, it keeps the economy turning, and that's absolutely vital. But she's supportive of the main principle of universal credit, to increase incentives to work. The reforms have been repeatedly delayed, but ministers believe they are finally on track for a full rollout by 2022. Bedtime reading at senior levels of Whitehall is a pamphlet by the welfare guru Nick Timmins. Universal credit from disaster to recovery. We've seen far too often when governments put a system in too quickly and you know, pe people shouldn't be going through a sausage machine, they should be going through the machine that treats them as humans and individuals and if we take longer to get that right then that's absolutely fine by me. The former pensions minister is less convinced. It is delay after delay. We are slowly getting there, we are told, but unfortunately I don't think anybody can totally and confidently predict when exactly this will all be rolled out, how exactly it would all be rolled out, and what the cost implications truly are. The government knows welfare can quickly become a highly toxic issue, not least when money is scarce. If a magic wand could be waved in Whitehall, assuming an extra two billion could be found down the back of the sofa, benefits would be cut off at a slower rate as low-paid workers increase their hours.